I'm going to be different, and I'm going to put this up here. Because I noticed last, last few times I spoke, I could not see everybody in the back. And, you know, if you're napping, I just want to know. You know, I just, I just need to know. Now, uh, good morning. I hope that everybody's uh, having a good morning so far. And uh, it is a beautiful day. I was so happy this morning whenever I just got up and I, I saw and I felt the temperature and all this stuff. But let me make a couple uh, just real, real brief announcements to you. If you will notice, these little connection cards I've made are sort of on the inside of all the different aisles. And I hope we don't run out. But if, if you're comfortable, please uh, fill this out for me. And the whole purpose behind this is it's just something for me because, you know, I really do want to do life together with you all. I want to get to know you. I want to build a relationship with you, but I can't do that unless I know how to get in touch with you and how to get in contact with you. So um, fill that out if you're comfortable and just leave it in the pew behind set and I'll come pick it up later. And there is a little line down at the bottom that says, would you like to schedule a visit or call with Chris? And if you circle yes, then, you know, I'm going to call you or try to just come to your house, set up a meeting time with you. But uh, that's just so that way we can get to know each other a little bit better. But if you fill one out last week and you haven't heard from me yet, I know I've I got quite a few that said yes, and so I'm just working my way through the list, so be patient with me and all that stuff. But one more thing I want to do real quick this morning is, uh, yesterday was a Veterans Day, and that was a, it's a very significant, very special holiday. So I just want to take a moment and uh, recognize any veterans that we may have. So um, if you are someone that is a veteran or has served, would you please just uh, stand up for a second, and we want to give you a round of applause and just uh, thank you for your service. So if you are a veteran, just uh, stand up and let us give you a, a hand. Thank you. Let's uh, open up with a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for uh, your son. I thank you for my brothers and sisters uh, here with me this morning. And I'm just thankful that I have a chance to uh, share your word, share your gospel. But this morning, I pray, Lord, that this is not me speaking, but nearly you using me as a vessel to say whatever you'd like to be said. And Lord, uh, I just pray that whatever everyone here needs to hear this morning is what they hear. And I just pray that it can be a beneficial to you and that in the end we can all glorify you. It's in your name that I pray. Amen. So we're moving into the holiday season pretty quickly. It honestly came faster this year. And man, it, holiday and this kind of stuff, it just moves so fast the older I get. And I know that you guys are like, yeah, yeah, one day wait and see how fast it moves. And I know it's going to move faster as I get older, but I really am starting to see how fast it's coming. But for me, the holiday season this year means three different things. Like, there's three things that just come to mind when I think of it. The first is sickness time. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, kids, for, you know, passing around sickness and all that stuff. It's becoming unavoidable, just all the sickness and stuff that starts to go around. Uh, the other thing is it makes me think of uh, harvest time. You know, where we moved from, there was a whole lot of farmers. And uh, this time of year is whenever the harvest is just sort of finishing up. And you know, it's when they're really rushing and sprinting trying to get the corn, the beans harvested before it gets too late. So that's just sort of on my mind because that's where I came from. And the third thing, of course, is dinner time because that is the best part of this time of year, right? Is being able to sit together at Thanksgiving, you know, all the days in between that and Christmas, then Christmas morning, Christmas afternoon, and just think of all the wonderful food and all the wonderful company that you have. Because whether, it, whether it's the turkey or whether it's, you know, the company that you have, it's just a wonderful time to be able to sit together and enjoy a meal. But there is something that is going to happen to all of us this holiday season. Now, no matter where you are, um, no matter how old you are, no matter what your family get together is going to look like, there's one thing that we're all going to have in common. And that is we're all going to have an expectation of how we think it's going to go. So you may be thinking like, man, I'm going to have the house perfectly cleaned. I know that I'm going to have six people come over and it's going to be wonderful. Or you may be thinking, you know, I, I'm just really excited to make myself, you know, a pot of chili and watch football on Thanksgiving Day. And that's how it's going to go. We all have this expectation of what we think it's going to be like. And, you know, those expectations usually don't turn out the way that we think they're going to, right? You know, yesterday, and by the way, I have a, be a new best friend at this church. It's Darren Higgins because he invited me to go to a U.K. football game yesterday, right? And I knew that we were going to play Alabama and... We may not want to think this way, right? But, you know, I knew we were going to lose. It's okay. But, you know, I also thought I expected it to be a little bit closer. It was not close at all. You know, it just, it was demoralizing, you know, from about two minutes into the game. But that expectation fell short. You know, and more times than not, our expectations do tend to fall short, don't they? You know, it doesn't really matter what your family situation is. 
It doesn't matter if you're expecting to eat with 100 people in a few days or if you're expecting just to sort of be alone and have a nice, relaxable, enjoyable day. But our expectations, they fall short so many times. And they just don't always go the way that we want them to go. I mean, so often in life, isn't it, that we have our own plan, our own ideas, and our own thoughts on how something is going to work out, and then it just doesn't go that way at all. So how are we supposed to handle this? How do we handle one of our expectations of the holidays of life whenever it goes south? It doesn't end up the way that we want it to. When we were so, so excited for something and then we're just disappointed at the end. We start to ask ourselves questions like, did, did I do something wrong? What did I mess up? We start to wonder and ask, you know, is this God's fault? You know, does, does God still love me? Where did God go? Where, where's the wrong thing that happened? Or, what now? You know, if this is you, then I want you to take some solace and some comfort this morning in knowing that you are not alone if this is how you feel. A lot of times, whenever we are disappointed, whenever we are crushed, we feel isolated and we feel alone. But I assure you that you are not alone. In fact, God has not left you and you're not the first to go through whatever situation you are going through. In fact, the disciples of Jesus is who we're going to talk about this morning. The people who have been closer to Jesus than just about anyone else on earth and ever would, they went through this exact same dilemma too. You know, they followed Jesus everywhere that he went. They weren't perfect. They ate with him. You know, and I know they messed up, but they were with Jesus for many years. They worshiped him. They followed him. You know, they got scared and they ran away from the cross. But for lack of better words, they saw him be crucified and they saw him be resurrected. And they went through a very similar experience. <clears throat> you see, I believe, putting myself in the shoes of the disciples, that after they saw their God, their Savior, their friend, Jesus Christ, resurrected, they were in a place of euphoria because they knew that this is wonderful. They knew undeniably the God of the universe is here, he's alive, and he's victorious, and I am on his side. I can't wait to keep on working and moving along with him. But then, Jesus sort of stopped showing up quite as frequently, at least in the flesh to them. And so I think it's safe to say the disciples may have been just a little bit disappointed. Their expectations may have fallen a little bit short of what they thought was going to happen. But even though their expectations fell short, they still were able to turn some positives and get to work and make a difference for the kingdom. And so that's what we're going to discuss this morning. So if you have your Bibles with us, why don't you flip over to the book of John, and we're going to be at the very last chapter, John 21. And we're going to go through a very famous account that I think does a great job of illustrating what we do whenever our expectations fall short. And then a little bit later on, how we find God in there. So we're going to go through this account. We're going to read through uh, verses 2 through 13. And we're going to sort of go through chunk by chunk and talk about it. And at the end, we're going to sort of apply that and figure out what is the point for me? How can I grow closer to the Lord? How can my holiday season be better? How can my life be better based on this experience of the disciples in the Gospel of John? But just real quickly, before we read, keep in mind, like I said, that at this point in history, Jesus is already resurrected, and he's already shown themselves, himself to the disciples a couple times, and they're sort of left wondering exactly what to do. So, John 21, beginning in verse 2. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. <clears throat> I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Now the disciples, at this point in history, they were sort of left to themselves, right? Jesus had gone. He hadn't ascended for the last and final time yet, but Jesus had sort of hidden himself for the time being from the disciples. And they were wondering, what in the world am I to do? It's sort of like that moment whenever you're with a family or a friend, and, you know, the event or the dinner that you went to is over, and then you two are just sort of like sitting there like, you know, uh, what do we do now? <laughs> you know, what am I supposed to do with myself? <clears throat> well, the disciples, they made a decision that I like because they decided to go fishing. <laughs> 
they went fishing in that time when they were trying to figure out what to do. And it wasn't a, a coincidental action. You know, a lot of those guys, their profession was fishing. They went back to what they were familiar with. They did not go do something crazy. They did not, you know, stay at home. They did not run off. They just started going back to their normal, everyday lives. You know, that's what they used to do for income. And from their point of view, their lives may have seemed to stop being so miraculous, <clears throat> and they were about to go back to normal. You know, yes, they had this relationship with Jesus. They had this relationship with the resurrected God. But my life is going to go back to normal. And they were probably struggling with that. Because what is this new normal? <clears throat> they didn't know what this new normal was. And they were trying to make some things work. They were trying to make things you know, fit like a, you know, a square peg through a round hole. And they were trying to make it work. And you know what? I'm sure that we all know that feeling. Whenever we are all of a sudden <clears throat> separated from family, I remember this feeling of whenever I finally got married and then all of a sudden you have to start making peace with the holiday season. You know, am I going to go to this family's get together or that family's get together? You know, you start to lose a little bit of touch, a little bit of familiarity. Or maybe whenever someone that was a key center part of your family, whenever they pass away, they move on. We start to wonder what in the world are we going to do now? It's an impossible and difficult task to just keep going and doing the exact same thing, right? Because life has changed. Our expectations have fallen short, and we don't know what to do. But you know, for the disciples, it would, this situation would have been super frustrating for them. And so with all this going on, they just turned back to fishing. But you know what? What would have been really frustrating for them, too, is that they fished as a profession, but then when they finally got back on the water, they didn't catch anything. They would have said, surely, if I'm going to go back to the life that I knew, at least I can have a little bit of success with it. No, they had no success at all. They went fishing. They did not catch a single thing all night long. Let's keep reading. John 21, 4. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. You know, while they were fishing, while all this was going on, Jesus was there on the shore watching them. While the disciples were out there struggling, trying to get back to some kind of life, trying to get back to normalcy, Jesus was there watching them. The very man the disciples missed, <clears throat> the very man that the disciples longed for, the very man that they were hoping to be in communion with once again, was right there about 100 yards from them. But the great irony is that they didn't recognize him. They were wanting their Savior back. They wanted to be in the presence of Jesus Christ again, but when he showed up, they didn't see him. They didn't recognize him. He was standing there. And th this sort of makes me think, you know, how many times in my life have I been looking for God, been looking for answers from the Lord, and I've just missed him? How many times have I begged for God to show up? How many times have I asked God for an answer or for his presence, and I've, I've just, I've missed him? He was there. And it was my fault. You know, I pray that I haven't, but that's something to keep in mind for all of us. Because of Jesus' own disciples, the people who knew his face, that knew his presence, if they were able to miss him, then I surely could miss him as well. Let's keep reading. Verse 5. He called out to them, Friends, are you any fish? Well, no, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. All of a sudden, this man that they didn't realize was Jesus calls out to them and says, hey, guys, hey, friends. And that's sort of an interesting word right there because our, our Bibles actually don't really do a good job of translating this. You know, sometimes when you read words, you don't get all the context. If, if you want to go back and look at some of the original language, a better way to translate that would have been to say, hey there, little buddy, or hey there, boys. Jesus was giving them sort of like a patronizing remark. He wasn't saying, hey there, good friends, let's do this. No, he was, he was patronizing them. You know, he was saying, oh, y'all don't know what you're doing, that's cute. Maybe it's because, maybe, maybe Jesus was a little bit annoyed that these guys, they didn't see him. You know, that's possible. But nonetheless, the disciples decide to listen to this strange man that they didn't know. This sarcastic man, 
this patronizing man, they listen to him anyway. You know, what's interesting about this as a fisherman is that typically, whenever they were to fish back then, you would put the boat, you know, 100, 200 yards from the shore, and they would cast their net in between the boat and the shore. That was where they had the most success. That was like the industry standard for how they were supposed to operate. And this man said, no, what you need to do is the exact opposite of what you would call common sense. You need to cast on the other side of the boat, the, the side where no one ever catches any fish. Well, to the disciples' credit, they tried it. And of course, they had so many fish hauled in that they couldn't even lift the nets. You know, to cast to the other side was strange. But out of desperation, they decided to. Anyway, let's keep reading. Verse 7. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, <clears throat> for they were not far from the shore, only about 100 yards. Let's notice something really, really important and really significant here in this scripture, okay? The disciples only noticed Jesus after he performed a miracle for them. It took a miracle, a literal miracle, in order for Jesus' own friends to recognize who he was. Once again, this makes me wonder, and it makes me ask sort of a personal question. In my own life, have I ever been busy, so, been so busy asking and praying for miracles that I have actually missed my Savior? Have I ever been so preoccupied looking for God to show up miraculously to take care of my situation, my problems, my dilemmas, that I have actually missed him himself? You know, I have a sneaking suspicion that I have, because I'll be honest, a lot of my prayer time tends to be asking for things or for healing for myself or others. I probably don't spend anywhere near enough time actually asking to be in the presence of Jesus, of God. And I have a suspicion that many of us may make the same mistake. You know, there's been many times in my life where I, I did have faith and I expected miraculous works and for whatever reason, I didn't get the result I wanted. But maybe God, Jesus was there saying, I'm here, run to me. And instead I was there busy waiting on a, a net full of fish. But when the disciples finally saw Jesus, when they finally came to this realization, what did they do? Right? They went to him, immediately went to him. Now granted, Peter, as Peter is wont to do, you know, he threw caution to the wind, and he just like threw off part of his clothes and jumped in the water, which is awesome, you know, very humbling for him to do that. The other guys, they had a little bit more composure, and they at least went and they, you know, tied up the boat first. But they immediately left what they were doing, and they ran over to Jesus. Now, I don't know if anyone in here is a fisherman. I like to fish somewhat. But it is a huge testament for these guys to have caught all those fish and then to immediately leave and go to Jesus. Like, I would think it's like if you're fishing somewhere and all of a sudden you roll up to a little cove, you cast, on the first cast you catch like a 10-pound bass, right? You reel it in, it's awesome, and then you decide to leave. You don't do that, right? You stay a little bit longer to see what else you can get. But these disciples, when they finally saw, they finally recognized Jesus, they went to him. They didn't stay around looking for their own prosperity. They didn't stay around looking for their own success. To their credit, they went to Jesus. Now let's finish our text. Verse 9. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. But Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dare ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Then Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them, and he did the same thing with the fish. Finally, the disciples, they were reunited, at least for a moment, with their Savior. They were reunited with Jesus Christ, their friend that they followed. 
And what was Jesus doing? He, he was there on the shore preparing breakfast. And did you notice what he was preparing? This is a really fascinating connection in Scripture. He was grilling some fish and some bread. And of course, there's another famous story of Jesus being on a beach, preparing a meal out of fish and the bread. Right? The feeding of the 5,000. Let, let, let's read a brief passage of that really quickly from Matthew 14. Verse 15 says, As evening approached, the disciples came to him. This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven. He gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. Here are two instances in scripture where there is a miraculous feeding of people, bread and fish. You know, in, in the story of the feeding of the 5,000, it's really, it's really fascinating. It's really interesting. Jesus had the disciples, and he said, go and feed the people. And the disciples said, I can't. And almost in a way, Jesus says, I know. Let me feed them. Bring me this, and I will be the one to multiply and to give out the food. But in our story now, the story of this miraculous catch, something different happens. You know, Jesus is on the shore. He's preparing the bread and the fish. And he says, once again, disciples, bring me some fish. And this time, they were able to. This time, Jesus instructs them out of verse 10. Once again, it says, Jesus said, bring some of this fish that you have just caught. And this time, whenever Jesus instructs them to do this, the disciples are able to. Right, this is very symbolic, and it's a very cool connection in Scripture, because now it's as if Jesus is handing over the baton of ministry from himself to the disciples. He's saying, I have given you the tools that you need, and I am empowering you to go out and to feed the people. Now, of course, they still relied on Jesus in the first place to catch the fish, right? Right? They didn't catch it all on their own. They couldn't catch it on their own, just like how we can never do anything really on our own. We rely on Jesus every single step of the way. But Jesus gave them a job to do. At this point, the disciples, they knew that they had a job to do. They knew that they had a purpose and that they mattered. No longer were they left wondering what to do. No longer were they just there you know, in misery, waiting on their Savior to return, wondering, what in the world am I supposed to do? Now the disciples knew that through the power of Jesus Christ and through his blessing, they had a job to do. Listen, this morning, church, it is our job as well. Maybe our job isn't literally to go and to feed other people fish. Maybe it is. We do have a wonderful food pantry. But our job as a church and our job, each and every single one of us, and the thing that we should truly expect is it's our job to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. I don't know what expectations you have in life. I don't know what you're hoping to get out of life. I don't know what you're hoping to get out of this holiday season or anything else. But we have a common job, a common role that Jesus Christ has given us. It is feed the world, to take the gospel out. And so with all this in consideration from this story and with the holiday season approaching, I see four variable, very valuable lessons that we should take from this. Because once again, I think that there's a ton of people in here that are hurting from different things going on in life. A lot of us are confused. We have to face a holiday season that is different that's not like any other we've experienced. And so how are we supposed to move forward with life whenever we are expecting Jesus, but we just don't see him yet? What should we be doing? Four very quick lessons this morning. First is you should expect God to show up. So many of us are so desperate for God to come into our lives, but we have so little faith that he actually will. Now, this is a common theme along, amongst a lot of Christians, is all of us want more and more of God in our lives, 
but not all of us actually have the faith that he will come. Psalm 27, 14 says, Wait for the Lord and be strong. Take your heart as you wait. And the thing is, is whenever we actually believe that something is going to happen, we change the way we act and live, right? So let's talk about Thanksgiving, right? If you're going to invite someone over for Thanksgiving lunch, Thanksgiving dinner, and you expe you've expected them to show up, they say that, yes, I'm going to come by. What do you do? Well, you clean your house a little bit more. You cook food, but you cook enough food for them, a little bit extra food, right? Because you actually expect them to arrive. Whenever we actually have faith, whenever we actually expect something, we change the way that we live. I would say that if on Thanksgiving morning, if you tell me that you're expecting company, yet you only cook enough food for yourself, I would say you did not expect company. I do not believe you. And so as a Christian, if you're telling me that you expect the return in the presence of God, of Jesus Christ, yet you don't work at all on getting your life in order in a way to please him, it's hard to believe. You should expect God to show up. Have faith and get ready for that company. The second lesson, don't miss him when he comes. See, this is where I think the disciples had their big problem that evening and that morning. They thought that Jesus would eventually return, and he did, and he was right there, but they missed him. They got distracted. They got distracted by trying to, to spend some busy time. They just wanted to fill time. They wanted to try to find purpose, and they started looking elsewhere. When Jesus finally came and arrived, they had no idea he was there. We have to be careful. We cannot get so fixated like the disciples did. We cannot get so fixated on asking for miracles, on asking for deliverance, that when God shows up to be there with us, we miss him. You know, it reminds me of a wonderful story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We're, we're all probably familiar with the story. If you're not, you know, three men refused to bow down to Nebuchadnezzar, to the golden statue, and they were thrown in the fiery furnace. And, you know, God spared them from the furnace in a way, but you know what? They still had to go into that fiery furnace, and you know how they were spared? Was he showed up there with them. He didn't give them a get-out-of-jail-free card where they never had to go through any trials. Instead, he was there with them, and they didn't miss him. So let's return to that example of Thanksgiving dinner, right? So you, you are expecting company, and they're going to arrive. But you could be so busy trying to get the dinner ready. You could be so busy with that vacuum cleaner just going over the house like 18 times that whenever your company eventually shows up and they're knocking on the door, you don't hear it. You weren't ready. You expected them and you did some of the right things, but you were so preoccupied on the material things going on that you totally missed them. And eventually, after a while, your guests, they're not gonna hang around. They're gonna leave. They're not gonna sit there and knock for hours and hours and hours waiting to get in. We have to be ready for him when he comes. You know, this is where I think our prayer life gets important as Christians. Like, yes, I absolutely think that we should pray for healing, we should pray for miracles, but we have to pray also that we don't miss Jesus whenever he actually comes and reveals himself to us. And I'm, I don't necessarily think that he's going to show up in the flesh and the blood, but I promise you that if you ask for God to open your eyes and ask God for wisdom, then you will see God working in the world. Our third lesson is that when he shows up, we have to bask in his presence. And this is something that is, there's something that really annoys me that sometimes happens to me whenever I will go and I will visit, uh, or I should say it's happened before whenever I would go and visit people. I, I would go and I would knock on the door and they would answer me and we would hug and we'd be all happy to see each other. They would say, come, come take a seat in the couch, and I would. And then do you know what the person would do? They would go in the kitchen and just leave me, right? I was there all alone in the house or maybe with family, and the person I came over to see wouldn't hang out with me at all because they were too preoccupied with trying to make cookies or spaghetti or whatever that they were trying to do. They would not actually come and spend time with me. 
They were thinking that they were being a gracious host when really they were ignoring their guests. It makes me think of that story from, uh, from Luke 10, Mary and Martha. Verse 40, but Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. So she came to him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. And Mary has chosen what is better. It will not be taken from her. When it comes time to focus on the Lord, Focus on the Lord. We can't just be satisfied with our proximity to him. We can't just be satisfied that we are a little bit closer than others. When we're in the presence of God, focus. Whenever you're at church, it's hard. I know there's distractions. I have young kids. I get it. But we try our best to focus on him. When we are in our prayer time at home, don't let our mind wander. Be disciplined. Stay focused on God. When we are reading scripture, don't, don't check our phones every single time we hear the ESPN chime go off. Right? Focus on scripture. We have to bask in his presence or else we are going to miss him. I know it's impossible to cut out all distractions. I know. But we have to do everything that we can so that way we do not miss God when he is here. Because we would honestly never forgive ourselves afterwards whenever we realize that, wow, I had this time and this moment with the Lord, and I decided to look on Twitter instead, or I decided to do nothing instead. The fourth lesson that I think that we should have, or that we get from this passage, is that we need to love him until he returns. Personally, I've started to enter a stage in life where um, I'm no longer just a, you know, participant in our family dinners. I, I now have a family and I've do certain things. I'm starting more and more to become, like a better words, a glue that helps hold family together. I, I see that I have an important, I have an, a valuable role with my family, as each of you all do as well. And I'm starting to realize that if I'm not there and if I'm not committed to my family, if I'm not committed to these relationships, then they're going to dissolve over time. This is the same responsibility that Jesus has given his disciples. They are no longer passive members of his friend group. The disciples are no longer just random dudes following Jesus around and watching him. The disciples now have a mission. They have a job. They have a purpose in the world. And that is where we are today. You know, I, I don't know how you feel or, or where you think you are in life, but you have a job. You have a mission and a purpose in God's kingdom. Sometimes we don't like to think that because we don't want to think that our own actions matter. You know, if I tell myself that I have no formal role, if I tell myself that I'm not significant, then I give myself an excuse to mess up. I give myself an excuse to be selfish. I give myself an excuse to be prideful. But down inside, I don't buy it. But I'm trying to convince myself. See, each one of you here this morning, you have a divine role in the kingdom of God that only you can fill. And you need to fill that role until the Lord returns. And you know what? What's great is when you become a Christian, whenever you are baptized in water, whenever you repent, turn your life around. And when you receive that gift of the Holy Spirit, you have God's assistance and you have God's help to do it because you have God in you. He leads you, he guides you, and he helps you. You still have to do it, but he is right there with you all the time. But there is another truth to this whole matter as well. And that is that we've been talking as though God has left us. We've been talking as though Jesus has left us. And the truth is that he hasn't, really. He hasn't left us at all. But instead, we, we think he has, because we're the ones who have a hard time finding him. Just like the disciples, they thought that Jesus had left them, but he was right there on the shore the whole time with them. Don't be tricked into thinking that God has left you. Don't be tricked into thinking that God doesn't care, that he doesn't want to be around you, or whatever else, just because you can't see him. We have to pray 
that God will open our eyes, and we have to look for him first and foremost. And the good news is that if you are a Christian, you do have that Holy Spirit, and he's right there. He's right there in you. But the good news is that if you're someone that uh, has never actually made that commitment to be a Christian, if you've never made that formal commitment to follow God, and if you don't have that gift of the Holy Spirit, it's pretty easy. It's pretty simple. You just have to take a moment. You have to give up on yourself and say, I put my own desires aside. I put my own pride aside. I want to ask forgiveness for my sins. I want to follow the Lord, and I want to be baptized in his name because I want forgiveness of my sins and because I want to make a difference in the kingdom of God, just like the disciples do. So if that's you this morning, as we get time to move into our decision time, our invitation time, I, I pray that you consider it. And I pray that you work on getting yourself right with the Lord. Let's pray as we move into this time. Grace, Heavenly Father, I thank you for your son, Jesus. As we move into this time, I just, I, I pray that you will work on our hearts. Lord, we, there's many Christians here, but there's also some non-Christians. And I just want to ask that you will move on all of our hearts. Because we're all in a different step on this journey in our relationship with you. I pray that you can move us. And that one thing that we can all have in common is as we leave here, we take one more step towards you and that we can move closer to you. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.